John Brown, a failed businessman turned radical abolitionist, became a leading figure in the fight to end slavery in the United States. Whether you perceive him as a violent belligerent or a civil rights hero, there's no denying the mark he left on history. Hello everyone, welcome to Top 10 History, your hub for historical lists and amazing history facts. Today, we're going to go over the top 10 amazing facts about John Brown. Make sure to watch until number 1 because it's one of the most amazing facts about the freedom fighter that will surely surprise you. Before we begin, if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to the channel with notifications on because we release a new historical top 10 list every single day. Also, make sure to smash that like button. Alright, let's get right into the video. He declared bankruptcy. Before John Brown was the radical abolitionist that we know him as today, he was a business owner. Originally, John Brown had the dreams of becoming a minister, but he ended up becoming a tanner, following in the footsteps of his father. He also started his own business and got involved in the wool trade. His other side gigs included building canals and surveying newly acquired territories. In efforts to expand his business, he bought land in northeastern Ohio in 1835. However, two years later, there was a financial crisis stirring things up across the nation, known as the Panic of 1837, causing a depression. Due to this depression, profits for John Brown went way down and he was forced to declare bankruptcy in 1842. The leftover wool that he had from his business was later sold at a reduced price in Europe just to get it out of his hands. After returning to the United States, he faced multiple lawsuits for illegally peddling wool in Europe. His home was a stop in the Underground Railroad. John Brown was a leading figure in the Underground Railroad and he devoted the rest of his life to helping slaves escape to the north. Brown moved to the small town of Guy Mills, Pennsylvania, where he set up a tannery for his business. He also built a barn that had a top secret room where slaves were free to hide away. John Brown's home officially became a stop in the Underground Railroad, with slaves frequently coming and leaving from his home. It was said that he helped over 2,500 slaves while he lived in Guy Mills. Eventually, John Brown would move out of Pennsylvania and onto Ohio, where as you previously learned, he would face the demise of his business. Unfortunately, the building was destroyed decades later in 1907, but it still remains a historical site that you can visit to this day, and it has earned a spot on the National Register of Historic Places. He had a major role in Bleeding Kansas. After the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed in 1854, this opened up for the people of the Kansas and Nebraska to vote on whether they wanted the new territories to become free or slave states. Many Americans, both pro-slavery and abolitionists, moved to Kansas in droves in order to influence the vote in their favor. One of the Americans was none other than John Brown, who moved to Kansas in 1855. And as you can imagine, with large numbers of people from both sides moving to Kansas, there was a lot of new tension in the area, so much tension that it led to violence and murder, a period of violence that would come to be known as Bleeding Kansas. In the end, the final vote declared Kansas to be a free state, but unfortunately, the violence from this event just increased hostility between the northern and southern states and would lead up to the bloodiest conflict in American history, the Civil War. He played a role in the 1856 Potawatomi Massacre. Speaking of the violence in Kansas, let's talk about the Potawatomi Massacre. In 1856, the town of Lawrence, Kansas, the town in which John Brown was currently living in, was attacked by pro-slavery settlers. On the very next day, Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts who was an abolitionist, was beaten unconscious right on the Senate floor by Representative Preston Brooks. And this was in retaliation for a speech that Sumner made about the events happening in Kansas. In retaliation for what happened in Lawrence and in the Senate, John Brown led a group of his followers into a pro-slavery town and killed five pro-slavery settlers in the middle of the night. John Brown participated in many other fights and battles throughout Kansas, and he would end up losing one of his sons in the violence. He eventually left Kansas in 1859. He personally escorted slaves to the north. After leaving Kansas in 1859, he had to pass through the slave state of Missouri. But being the hardcore abolitionist that he was, he wasn't going to enter a slave state and leave without freeing a few slaves. While in Missouri, him and his followers freed 11 slaves, killing one of their slave owners in the process. Due to this murder, President Buchanan himself put a bounty on John Brown's head. After freeing the slaves in Missouri, Brown and his followers personally escorted them all the way to Detroit, Michigan, a distance of over 1,000 miles. When they reached Detroit, they helped the escaped slaves get on a ferry and sail to freedom in Canada. To Brown, seeing 11 people reach freedom was well worth the 1,000 mile journey and the $250 bounty on his head. 
He intended to instigate a nationwide uprising. John Brown was undeniably an ambitious man, but he actually intended to arm 1,000 slaves across the southern states and instigate an entire nationwide uprising. And the first step of this plan started with his infamous raid on Harper's Ferry, where he attempted to take control of an armory that had about 100,000 weapons inside. Of course, this plan failed miserably, leading to John Brown's capture and arrest. President Buchanan himself ordered for John Brown to be taken down, and Robert E. Lee himself, along with a detachment of U.S. Marines, put down the attempted plot. John Brown at least hoped that his actions in Harper's Ferry would inspire others to do the same, which would inevitably lead to a nationwide uprising. However, this never happened. In the violence of Harper's Ferry, 10 of John Brown's followers were killed, including two more of his sons. He predicted the Civil War. After his unsuccessful raid on Harper's Ferry, he was put on trial a week later along with some of his followers who were involved in the incident. Brown did not think that he would receive a fair trial, being that he was never counseled or was allowed the opportunity to advise with anyone. During the trial, he even said, quote, I am ready for my fate. I do not ask a trial. I beg for no mockery of a trial. I ask again to be excused from the mockery of a trial. Although pleading not guilty, he was found guilty of murder, treason, and conspiring with slaves. He was sentenced to be hanged. On the day of his execution, he left a note that said, I am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be burned away, but with blood. This little prophecy that he wrote turned out to be true, as the nation would break out into all-out civil war just a year and a half later. He was buried in North Elba, New York. Ten years before his death, John Brown purchased over 200 acres of land in North Elba, New York. He purchased the land from a man named Garrett Smith, who was a wealthy abolitionist. Brown had originally promised Smith that he would help his family with making good use of and cultivating the land. However, this promise fell short following his death. The property was located in Timbuktu, and many acres of the property were given to African American families in order to give them what they needed in order to vote, so voting rights were only given to landowners at the time. Following Brown's hanging, his body was brought back to his farm in North Elba, where it was buried on the property. The site of John Brown's burial remains an official historical site of New York State. His song became the battle hymn of the Republic. Following John Brown's death, he quickly became recognized as a martyr, and his actions were seen as heroic and praised by fellow abolitionists. Well, most abolitionists. Abraham Lincoln said about Brown, Old John Brown has been executed for treason against the state. We cannot object, even though he agreed with us in thinking slavery was wrong, that cannot excuse violence, bloodshed, and treason. For those that thought of him as a martyr, a popular hymn called Say Brothers Will You Meet Us was written with new lyrics honoring John Brown. The existing melody with the new lyrics became known as John Brown's Body. This new song spread very rapidly in the North and became a song of inspiration and hope to rid the world of the evil of slavery. A woman named Julia Ward Howe took the same song and gave it another new set of lyrics, which is known as the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which became an official Union Army marching song. The Battle Hymn of the Republic is still widely performed to this day. He was praised by Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is a highly praised author who lived in France during John Brown's life. Some of his most famous work include The Hunchback of Notre Dame as well as Les Miserables, which itself is a story rooted in the ideas of freedom and revolution, being that the main character, Jean Valjean, is an escaped slave. While well, Victor Hugo was following the events going on in the New World and he himself was an abolitionist. Learning about John Brown's arrest and impending execution, he wrote a letter to his captors in an attempt to appeal his execution. His letter read, I fall on my knees, weeping before the great starry banner of the New World. I implore the illustrious American Republic, sister of the French Republic, to see to the safety of the universal moral law to save John Brown. Higo's attempts were unfortunately unsuccessful, but the author did not fail in declaring his admiration and respect for the fellow abolitionist. Did these facts shock you? Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss out on more amazing historical facts and much more. If you like this video, check out the next video on the 10 pandemics that changed history. Alright, have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the next video.